Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, both at home and in our studio audience, and welcome to the 2016 HCAM candidate debates. I'm HCAM News Director Tom Nappy, and I will be the moderator for tonight's debate. This evening, we will hear from five groups of candidates in contested races, Town Clerk, Town Moderator, Board of Health, Parks and Recreation, and the Board of Selectmen. Our panelists this evening include freelance reporter Michelle Murdoch, president of EHOP Amy Ritterbush, as well as myself. Our format for these debates is simple. We will alternate asking each candidate questions and they will have one minute to respond. If you hear the bell, you have 10 seconds remaining. Following the question and answers, each candidate will have one minute each for a closing statement. Up first are the candidates for town clerk, Mr. Henry Kanicki and Mr. Connor Deegan. Michelle Murdoch will start us off with the first question. Okay, um, the first question for clerk candidates is, why will you make a good town clerk? What skills do you bring to the position that will make you successful? Uh, basically, I, <clears throat> I bring a lot of experience to the position. I've, I'm highly organized when it comes to business operations and I understand the importance of the position. I've also worked with all of the managers from different departments and executives throughout the town, both the elected and non-elected officials for the last 20, 30 years. So I, what I bring to town is a continuation of this experience in looking forward to working with them. All right, Mr. Deegan. I fortunately am able to bring a great deal of passion to this along with an extensive knowledge due to my background and education in politics, not mostly in uh, local politics along with some state, which that along with elections background has given me a real window into the town clerk's office. Working with the town clerk's office for the better part of a year has also helped me to fully gather what effort will be going into this office and all of the responsibilities that will be involved. Uh, I was also able to attend a few different meetings and conferences that were able to give me more info on the elections process and the town clerk's role in it, along with charter review and a few other important pieces. All right. Mr. Kanicki, you stated that you would like to see the, see the town clerk as an appointed position rather than an, an elected, and that is one of the goals if elected to see that through. Can you explain why? I really think the town clerk position is an important one. And all the important positions in town have become appointed positions where they have a chance to review the candidate's background, go out in an open process and select from a wide range of candidates and get the best potential person for that job. It's not just two, three, four people running for election. It, they draw from a larger pool. And I think this is important to the town. Our town has grown from 7,000 to almost 18,000 people since I've been in town. And we really need some professionals in all of these offices to run these things. I look at this the way I looked at my career in working with whatever position I was filling for the company. I always wanted to get the best person for that, for that slot. All right, uh, Mr. Deegan, do you feel this should be an elected position or appointed position and why? I actually truly feel that it should be an elected position. I believe it gives the people a strong voice in one of the last uh, municipal job that is elected in the town. We should really look at this as not just a tradition that should be upheld, but also something that gives people a chance to choose who represents them in an office that is deeply involved in elections rather than having it fall to anyone who might have an ulterior motive to it not saying that anyone necessarily would, but moving into the future, you never know if the influence of a few select people picking a role like this could lead to other influences on the position. Okay, uh, Amy has our next question. Mr. Kanicki will answer first. Okay. If elected, will you pursue becoming a certified municipal clerk and a CMC? Yes, uh, I understand there's courses that are taken. Mm -hmm. I would pursue that uh, actively and get that done as quickly as possible. Okay. And Mr. Deegan, the same question? Yes, I had actually already planned and looked into applying up at Plymouth State University where the courses are held. 
Okay, uh, well, that will wrap up the question portion uh, for our town clerk candidates. We will now give each candidate one minute for a closing statement. Uh, we'll start off with you, Mr. Deegan. I just want to thank you for having me in the debate and allowing me to come here and tell you exactly how I feel about this and ask the questions to both of us that voters need to know. I hope that you all come out and vote for me on Election Day to help us to create a more intelligent elected populace in our town, to create more people who want to actually be involved in politics, and to increase the voice in our town and the passion that I want to bring to this office. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Kanicki. Yeah, I look at the town court position as really uh, the grease that makes the wheel, wheels run. It is really not a political position from the standpoint of where politics play in it, but it's really the nuts and bolts of how this town works. And that's why it's important to have someone with experience and really willing to, to get in and work on these, on these areas. Uh, leave the, the politics to the selectmen and to the other members of the town and let the town clerk really run, run the day-to-day -day operation for what has to be done on time and all the filings that have to be done on time. I thank you for the opportunity to speak and I sincerely ask you for your vote. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Thanks to both of you for taking part in tonight's debate. Thank you. Now we have two candidates for town moderator, Mr. Thomas Garabedian and Dr. Bruce Carlin. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, we will start with a question and answer period. You have one minute to answer each question. If you hear the bell, you have 10 seconds remaining. Following that, each of you will have a minute for a closing statement. I have the first question, and we'll start off with Mr. Garabedian. Mr. Garabedian, in your closing statement at the Hopkinton Women's Club Meet the Candidates Night, you said, I pledge to make town meeting great again. What did you mean by that? <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know, it was an attempt to uh, introduce a little humor into the situation. Um, Town meeting has certainly been very good over the past 30, 40 years. Uh, you know, I've experienced it over the past 27, uh, which has been uh, my family's tenure in Hopkinton. Um, in terms of making it great, I think town meeting can be made great by being run a little bit more efficiently so that it encourages more people to participate and we get uh, a, an even more diverse set of views from, from the town population uh, expressed at town meeting, and that was, that's essentially it. Okay. Um, do you have any suggestions for improvements that could be made to town meeting? We'll start off with Dr. Carlin on this one. Uh, I think that town meeting runs very efficiently. Uh, if you take a look at the last town meeting, we averaged about 10 minutes uh, an article. There's a lot of uh, material to get through there um, uh, you cannot um, uh, shortcut some of the processes that uh, provide you the efficiencies so uh, I can't always tell a committee that they've got to get all of their ducks in a row before they bring an article to town meeting floor uh, I think that uh, we've done a very good job on the background, and it's the background of the meeting that's most critical to making town meeting run efficiently. As far as the meeting itself is concerned, you've got your two minutes at the mic, and uh, some of the, the most fun stuff comes out when people really don't know what they're saying. Um, so I think that uh, the town meeting itself runs efficiently. We've got uh, a lot of work that goes on in the background to make it go efficiently with uh, new IT uh, additions uh, at, at the school level, uh, better um, graphics, and we're getting more clear with that. But there's a lot of, uh, I think it runs very efficiently as it stands. Okay, Mr. Garabedian, same question. Uh, you know, one concrete item comes to mind, and, and I think it was evident from this year's town meeting, the use of the consent calendar. It, it does seem that some people don't really understand it. And I got a sense that we spent more time explaining the consent calendar 
dealing with um, those items, uh, those articles that people did not want to be on the consent calendar, and then you know dealing with some confusion as we're going through the various articles that either were or were not included. Uh, to me, it's it's something that has been tried over the past several years, and it seems like uh, you know an idea whose time has passed based upon our experience. Okay, Amy has the next question. Mr. Garabedian will answer first. Okay. Some residents have wondered about the possibility of moving town meetings to Saturdays. In your opinion, would this be a good move or bad move, and why? Um, I, you know, I, I think it's certainly something that. Uh, we, we should be willing to try. I think there um, are certainly people who find it difficult to commit time during the, during the weeknight, um, you know, parents who, who have children to deal with. I understand we're competing a little bit with um, Saturday sports, but those people who are, um, you know, working in, in, in the work world might find it somewhat more convenient to be dealing with Saturday and you know, again, with town meeting being run in an efficient manner, ideally all of the business could be conducted in, in one day, and I think that would benefit uh, the, the town and, and benefit the process. All right, Dr. Carlin, same question. Uh, a lot of towns have actually tried that and have gone back to weeknights. Uh, that's a subject for the Charter Commission. Uh, we reviewed it uh, on the original Charter Commission, uh, and at the time, the we kept it at the, the same night. Uh, most of the testimony didn't favor the Saturday, but I, I, I'm not sure that one is better than the other, but if we listen to other towns that have, have gone back, they've, they've flip-flopped, but most have gone back to weeknights. Okay. All right, Michelle has the next question. Dr. Carlin will answer first. Okay, I, I may change my question slightly from what's written here. What I have written is, do you have any ideas about how to increase attendance at town meeting? Some of that was covered in your previous answers. Um, we'll let that stand, but um, I, I want to add to that, in addition to how would you increase it, do you have a sense for why, you know, some, sometimes we're lucky to get a quorum, and when you look at that there's, you know, 100 people out of X amount in town, what can we do about that? Uh, I would think that uh, um, it, it's a legislative body. Uh, the citizenry should be excited to run their own town. If there are no issues on the uh, warrant that uh, excite them, if they think, geez, the, uh, the budget looks fine to me, everything is, is going well. Uh, and there are a few people that are still passionate about items on the agenda and they come and they say, well, there's something that I want to talk about. But um, I, I'm not sure that uh, um, increasing the attendance per se is uh, as critical as making sure that the people that are there are engaged. And um, I think we've got a very engaged group that go to town meeting. All right, Mr. Garabedian, same question. Well, I think it is important that we end up with more people at town meeting. I mean, we're talking about a town that has a budget of between 75 and $80 million. And for 100 to 150 or 200 people to, um, to be making decisions with respect to budgets and, and um, planning and zoning bylaws and all of the other things that come before town meeting is somewhat disappointing. When there are you know, major financial issues, of course, there is a larger turnout. I think uh, you know, the, the moderator, along with other people uh, serving in, in volunteer capacities, as well as you know, people that are on the town payroll, um, can do more in terms of uh, advertising the, the issues that, that are likely to come before town meeting and uh, just creating greater awareness of those things that are going to be considered and, and making use of all of the different levels of publicity that are available to them to encourage greater participation. Okay. All right, I think that will wrap it up for our question portion. Uh, each candidate will now have about one minute to make a closing statement. We'll start off with Mr. Garabedian. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I won't repeat the quip that, uh, that I conveyed at Candidates Night. 
Um, town meeting has been run in a, in a very good manner. I think things can be improved uh, a little bit. That's certainly my aim. What I promise is respect for the process, respect for the issues that come before town, and respect for the people who participate in town meeting. And uh, I'll close simply by asking for your support on Election Day next Monday. Thank you. All right, Dr. Carlin. I love the process, and I thank all of you for being here, HKM, and uh, all uh, the various groups that help publicize and promote good government. Um, I think that town meeting is a wonderful institution, uh, and I agree with Tom that it would be nice if more people came. Um, I think that it's a um, uh, it's democracy at its best, and I think that a uh, well-run town meeting is what we we both aim for, and I think that we uh, have provided that for 20 years, and I hope uh, to have your vote on uh, May 16th. Uh, that's next Monday. And thank you for all that you've done here at HCAM. All right, gentlemen, thanks for participating tonight. Thank you. All right, still to come on the 2016 town election contested races debate, we'll have our parks and recreation candidates, our board of health candidates, and our selectmen candidates. For now, we are going to take a short break. A lot more to come. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the 2016 Contested Races debate here on HCAM. Our panelists include freelance reporter Michelle Murdoch, president of EHOP Amy Ritterbush, as well as myself, Tom Nappy. Earlier, we heard from the candidates for town clerk and town moderator. Up next, we have the two Board of Health candidates, Mrs. Jennifer Flanagan and Dr. Philip Cohen, Welcome to our program. A reminder, you will have one minute to answer each question. If you hear the bell, you have 10 seconds remaining. After that, each candidate will have a one minute closing statement. Michelle Murdoch has the first question. Okay, the first question is, can you please tell us about your education, work experience and skills and how they relate to the work of the Board of Health? We'll start off with Mrs. Flanagan. Okay. Hi, I'm Jennifer Flanagan. Um, my past history actually is in working with uh, a large insurance company, so I was sort of on the flip side of what we're doing here at the Board of Health, where what I would do is I would go into school and hospital cafeterias, restaurants, commissaries, and do a pre-inspection for them before they were um, maybe investigated by the Board of Health. And so actually my responsibility working for the insurance company was to ensure adherence with the uh, work site safety rules and the Department of Health rules. And so from that then we were hoping to sort of circumvent any uh, legal intervention after that. Um, also I, am, I work in business, I work as a um, project manager and um, I'm almost out of time. <laughs> a project manager and uh, and a relationship manager. So I think that all of that sort of brings something to the table with this. Okay, Dr. Cohen. Uh, good evening. Um, so I uh, am a physician. Went to medical school. I um, uh, am actually a practicing surgeon in the area. Uh, so from the health aspect, uh, I understand the uh, overall health of uh, the community. Uh, and I also uh, have good experience in uh, doing some light construction around the house, plumbing, electric, uh, et cetera. And uh, from my past year on the Board of Health, I uh, have recognized that uh, the Board of Health has a lot to do with not just simply the health of the community, but also has uh, very much to do with the health of your home uh, through your Title V uh, requirements, uh, the size of your septic system, uh, plumbing code uh, variances. Uh, and the like, um, and also has to do with uh, drinking water. Uh, so I've uh, been doing it for the past year, and I understand all the aspects that are uh, being asked of me at that point. Thank you. All right, Michelle. Okay, I have one more question. 
Uh, this one really has to do with motivation and commitment. And uh, we'll start with, uh, with you, Jen. Um, at the previous Women's Candidate Night, I think you said that, and I know you said, <laughs> that it was you were not seeking this position. It was something you were recruited for. So based on that statement, how will you convince voters that you have the motivation and commitment um, to do this job? That's a great question, and actually I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, when Darlene asked me to run, I had to give it a lot of thought, and then once I started thinking about the opportunity to give back to the community and the fact that I've always volunteered in town over the years, um, I've done a lot of volunteering in the schools, and back before I even lived in Hopkinton, and I've lived here 17 years, so going back probably 20 years, I used to volunteer with Bill and Rose Abbott at the Elmwood Farm for the Food for the Needy. Um, and I helped them with their coordination of volunteers and their fundraising efforts. So I've always been a very committed volunteer in this town, even before I lived here. Um, and also, the nice part for me is that I work from home. I have a super flexible schedule, so there is not going to be a problem with having to balance the two, um, the, the two jobs, I don't think. Okay, and same question to you, Dr. Cohen. Motivation and commitment. So uh, my motivation, um, when uh, John Cotino uh, had mentioned uh, uh, about a year ago that uh, he was a selectman and uh, we were starting to get to know each other and I had recently moved to town, uh, I've been living here now for three years, um, I immediately asked how I can get involved and uh, he had said, well, we have an opening on the Board of Health and I immediately uh, ran to fill that vacated spot. Uh, I've been committed to the uh, board ever since. Um, my attendance record's been, uh, I think, fairly good. I think that the only thing that keeps me from me making the meetings is when I have uh, patient emergencies and I'm able to actually craft my uh, practice so that I can actually make the meetings on a regular basis. Um, as far as motivation goes, I've been motivated, uh, uh, again, I, like I mentioned, for the past year. And uh, I plan on continuing to continue to be motivated because it's uh, part and parcel of my job every day to make sure that people are safe. Okay. All right. A uh, big debate among boards of health across the country is whether the age to purchase tobacco should be increased to 21. Uh, what are your thoughts on this issue and why? We'll start off with Dr. Cohen. Well, a uh, very, very good question. Um, here in Massachusetts, there are many municipalities that are uh, ra have already raised the age uh, of smoking to the age of 21, Boston being a, a major one. Um, the uh, interesting thing about that is that um, I am personally against tobacco products. I think that uh, uh, people should not smoke, and in, in case anybody's been wondering, it's actually really bad for you. Um, I can <laughs> clearly say that on TV with uh, the utmost of support. Um, the, uh, the reality is, is that uh, whether or not it should be law of uh, uh, the age of 21, I think that that's an excellent question. I'm pretty sure that there's going to be legislation coming th uh, through. The real question of whether or not I would su uh, suggest that for the town of Hopkinton is uh, just a matter of uh, what would the impact be on our businesses here in, in town? Would uh, we uh, steer people away from uh, buying cigarettes in town and go to uh, neighboring municipalities where there is no law? So it's a much more global issue than strictly at the town level, but if okay. you were to ask me, I would support it 100%. All right. Ms. Flanagan? Um, yeah, I actually thoroughly support it because so many of our neighboring communities have already done it. I actually grew up in Needham, and they were one of the first <coughs> towns in Massachusetts to pass that. And I think it actually did make a, a big difference. Um, I am, again, uh, like my uh, colleague here, uh, thoroughly 100% against it. Um, however, people do smoke. You're not going to stop people from smoking. And if the point is you're sending the 18 to 21-year-olds out to another town, I have no problem with that. I think that the, the bulk of cigarette purchases in our town, and there's not a lot of places in our town that actually sell cigarettes. Um, the liquor stores, the gas stations, that's pretty much it. And I don't think that they're hurting for business in other areas. So I don't think, like once stores like Hopkin and Drug doesn't sell, CVS doesn't sell, I just don't think that it's that much a part of our local economy anymore. And like I said, if it's just that age range we're sending out of town, I'm all for it. All right. Um, now, a question that's on many uh, national ballots uh, this year. 
Uh, are you in favor of the legalization of recreational marijuana use and why? We'll start off with Ms. Flanagan. Um, that's a really hard question. Um, I was a huge proponent for medical marijuana use because my mother's a breast cancer survivor. And so watching her go through chemotherapy, knowing that if she had been able to have marijuana at the time, it would have helped her greatly. Um, so that was a, a big thing for me. As far as recreational use, I'm torn, to be completely honest. I really think that in the long run, it's going to happen anyways. And it probably should because it raises tax dollars. It's the type of thing that if people are going to drink, if people are going to smoke, people are going to smoke marijuana. And I happen to know a lot about addiction. And I know that alcohol is highly addictive and very poorly regulated. Marijuana is not nearly as addictive, not even, not even close to as addictive as nicotine. And again, nicotine, not regulated. So I think not only is it a chance for us to step up and regulate something, but also make money off it as a community. Okay, Dr. Cohen? Uh, I think you put me in a very uh, uh, difficult position because I, uh, from the medical marijuana standpoint, um, I, uh, I absolutely agree with it for certain patients. Um, I can see that there's a possibility for abuse in the medical community. As far as recreational uh, drug use goes, um, legalization of marijuana is probably not dangerous. Uh, we see that in uh, various communities throughout the country. Um, I do see, however, that there are downstream effects. Um, now, if you were to talk about uh, those experimenters um, using marijuana as a gateway drug, I think that that's, uh, that is a, a problem. I don't see that there's a lot of widespread gateway data. But at the same time, y the bigger question is, is why, what is lead somebody, why is somebody leading to um, recreational drug use? And my bigger concern is that we're probably under-treating actual psychiatric and medical disease. Okay. Uh, Amy has the <coughs> next question. Dr. Cohen will answer first. Okay. So in your opinion, what is the most important function of the Hopkinton Board of Health? So uh, the most important function of the, of the Board of Health, in my opinion, would be to uh, protect the community in terms of not only uh, uh, overall health, but also uh, potentially for downstream uh, problems. So for example, if we allow uh, uh, people's homes to have problems with their septic supply, we can contaminate our groundwater, and this is the water that we drink. Um, if we allow uh, um, uh, people to have uh, farms that aren't regulated, then you know there can be contamination of uh, of air and um, and a lot of other problems associated with that. So we need to uh, protect our community. We need to protect the health of our community, um, not just in terms of uh, the groundwater, but also the uh, people around us. We need to ensure that our businesses are safe and they're going to continue to. Uh, provide safe service in terms of food and um, and uh, compliance with all the local laws as well. All right, Ms. Flanagan. Um, I actually agree with everything that uh, Dr. Cohen said because uh, obviously he's on the board and knows, and um, that was my definite take on it as well. Is that the whole point is to be protecting the community, um, both in uh, the restaurants and also as far as dealing with things like the mosquito population that will make it safe for all of our children to be playing outside and playing in the parks. And if we have to treat mosquitoes, um, how do we do it safely with uh, pesticides that aren't dangerous to the children. Um, again, I'm sure Kelly will have to address this, the, the weed situation. How do we address the weed situation and still keep it safe? So I think the whole point is just keeping the community safe, um, healthy, and still just making sure that we're not introducing things that we didn't need to introduce um, as far as dangerous pesticides and whatnot. Um, I think the other important role is also just cooperating with the Massachusetts State Board of Health because obviously there's a lot of give and take between that and there are some regulations that we dictate on our own and there's a lot that we actually have to answer to the state for. So I think it's really important that they are willing, that we are willing to work as a team and take some, uh, some advice from up above on that sort of thing. So. All right, well now it's time for our final question and Amy has our final question. Ms. Flanagan will answer first. Okay, and this is related to the previous question but one of the big topics in town has been the Lake Maspinac weed control and whether or not to use herbicides to kill the invasive weeds in the lake. 
Since this is a health-related debate from your perspective, do you feel it's a danger to use herbicides in the lake that is um, used for swimming and other recreational purposes? Well, that's an interesting question only because I know that it didn't pass at town meeting. Um, and it was a pretty wide ma margin by which it didn't pass. Um, I don't live on the lake, so for me, it sort of made sense if they could find safe herbicides to use that, uh, because I know that it's affecting so much. I mean, I read in the paper that it's even affecting uh, just children skating in the winter because it's such a shallow lake that the weeds are actually coming up through the ice. So we definitely have to do something, but I also know that there's been now $60,000 set aside um, to look at a healthier option. And so I'm not sure if that's going to be manual removal or working with uh, the community to not be putting the certain things into the water that are causing that problem. Um, but I wasn't as against herbicides until I read all the arguments. And so now thinking about children swimming there and uh, boating and all of that, it, it is going to be a tough one to, to, to figure out safely. All right, Dr. Cohen. Um, at, so in terms of uh, being in support of um, uh, herbicides for, the, for that, you know, I haven't seen actually which herbicide that they've decided to, uh, to utilize. Uh, I know that there's been a s several uh, plans, projected plans out there. Um, my expectation would be that uh, whichever plan we decide to go with and whichever company is going to provide the service, uh, whether it be through our DPW or, um, or otherwise, uh, I would expect them to come to the Board of Health with a, uh, with a um, what's called a, a material safety data sheet. So there should be some literature on this herbicide. Uh, these days, uh, herbicides, pesticides, they're all very, very safe. Um, they're, they're not the same uh, types of uh, substances that have been utilized in the past. Um, I think that we all, uh, being over the age of you know, 30, we've all been exposed to various substances that uh, we should not uh, have been exposed to. And uh, we just want to protect our, chil our children and, uh, and grandchildren from having any potential problem. Unfortunately, we're never going to be able to uh, fully 100% ensure that, but time will tell. So we just have to make the best choice now. All right, and uh, Michelle has a follow-up question. Uh, I, I do have one follow-up based on the question that was just asked. And uh, it kind of came to mind when you said that town meeting had voted against using the pesticides. So I guess my follow-up question is, who should decide? Um, does it make sense the town meeting is voting on what's the best solution and how much input should, say, the Board of Health have versus the general public? You want me first? Uh, yes, Ms. Oh, Flanagan, okay. sorry. Um, I actually think it's 100% appropriate that it be decided by town meeting yes or no. Um, because it is a town issue. It's not something that three people can sit in a room and make a decision for an entire town. And I totally 100% believe that putting that up at town meeting was the right thing to do, especially because a number of the people, a majority of the people at town meeting, use that lake all the time, both lakes all the time, and probably a lot of them also live on the lake. So I believe that they definitely deserve to have the input. I think that the time that the Board of Health would come in is when they decide to, yes, let's go with herbicides. That's when the Board of Health comes in and steps in and says, okay, great, now we've made a decision. We're going to go chemical versus manual or whatever the other options are. But at least now let's talk about getting a safer option and interview the companies that might do it. So I think town meeting had to decide yes or no, and then the Board of Health could help and probably work with the Board of Selectmen on choosing a company and choosing the healthiest option. All right, Dr. Cohen. <clears throat> so um, oddly enough, we've heard very little at the Board of Health about um, uh, uh, over the past year what the actual plan is going to be. Um, I think that I've seen one communication. Um, the, the town people, absolutely, we as uh, the community need to, uh, um, to vote on doing something. And I think that uh, the most important part of being in a town such as uh, the town of Hopkinton is that you can trust your board will uh, look into the best uh, herbicide option um, if we're presented with a, a, a various group. Um, interestingly, though, uh, uh, the decision will come from above and uh, probably just ask for the Board of Health's blessing. Uh, where, where the rubber meets the road will be on whether or not uh, the Board of Health, which does control whether or not you can swim in the lake, uh, will, uh, that's where the legislative action will occur. So hopefully there'll be a, a good, uh, as we get closer to a final decision, a very good cohesion of, a, of an overall plan with specifics on the actual material to be utilized. 
All right, that is it for the question and answer segment. Each candidate will now have one minute for a closing statement. We will start with Dr. Cohen. So I just wanted to thank everybody for the opportunity to come uh, this evening and, uh, and discuss uh, uh, various topics that are of very much importance. Um, I think that uh, I'm the right person for the job. I've been doing it for the past year. Uh, I understand the ins and outs of uh, the human body and human health, and uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, knowledge that you have to uh, uh, amass when it comes to this. So I'm not learning on the fly about uh, the various uh, substances, for example, that are going to be uh, utilized. Um, I can read and understand all of these materials. Uh, when it comes to various policies, I have um, a little bit of a conflict in that I do have my own personal beliefs, but I also have to be careful about what I say because I am a physician and I have to, uh, and that does carry weight in the community. Um, so, uh, but as I'm fully in support of all the legislative action that will occur, uh, and as far as my opportunity, I would love the, to continue to serve the town on this board for the next three years. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Flanagan. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, I kind of want to readdress the question that you asked me, Michelle, about my commitment. Um, and I hope that I made it really clear that although it wasn't something that I seeked out on my own, it is something that just feels really right to me. And I didn't come to that decision lightly, but I think I bring a really unique skill set to this group where I have the the background in the restaurant and cafeteria and that sort of that those inspections um, so I think that that's actually a really important part of the job and so I do believe that I bring really something different than a lot of other candidates would bring to this also in my day-to-day -day job I do have very broad scope uh, relationship management where I'm sort of bringing everyone in the company together and in this case it would be everyone in the town and then on the smaller side the project management where I'm really garnering resources to reach a common goal in which case in this position it would be garnering resources from the different departments within the municipal government so I do believe that I have a really good experience and can bring a lot to this so thank you very much for the opportunity all right, that will wrap up the Board of Health portion. Thank you both for participating this evening. Up next are our Parks and Recreation candidates, Ms. Kelly Karp and Mr. Eric Sonnet. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, for each question, you will have one minute to answer. If you hear the bell, you have 10 seconds remaining. After the questions, each candidate will have a one minute closing statement. And I have the first question. Parks and Recreation maintains facilities and runs programs for residents. What part of the Parks and Recreation Commission is most important to you? Where do you think the dollars should be spent? Ms. Karp, you can answer first. Uh, thank you. Um, I think it's in incredibly important that we offer, um, uh, continue to offer and build upon the um, athletic um, programs that we have and the cultural arts programs that we have. Um, I secondly feel that it's incredibly important that we uh, maintain uh, our facilities and our grounds so that they're safe and um, uh, you know appropriate uh, for, for the to be used so that no one gets hurt um, and that they are um, that they are uh, in good shape for everybody. Um, to me, I think the dollars should be spent in, um, like I said, offering programs um, that would be enriching to our, to our community, that would continue to um, provide um, athletic programs, not just for our children, but for adults, um, and that our, our uh, facilities and grounds are, are well maintained. Okay, Mr. Sonnet. The Parks and Rec is really in a unique uh, position. We are one of only two boards in town they interact with the majority of the citizens. One is the school board, the other is Parks and Rec. My background in town has always been more in the leadership and administrative capacity as selectman and DPW commissioner and things like that. The opportunity to be part of Parks and Rec is really a treat because I can see the citizens actually participating and enjoying the experience. As far as the parks and how parks and rec interacts between the uh, facilities and the people that use them 
Uh, it's not a question of where the money's spent. The programs are self-funding. They're paid for by the fees that we charge. In the case of the facilities, that requires a strategic leadership to provide facilities for the anticipated needs of the people that are going to use them. Okay. Uh, Amy has our next question. Mr. Sonnet will answer first. Okay. Several years ago, an enterprise fund was established to fund the Parks and Rec Department by user fees. Do you believe this is an efficient way to run the department? Well, enterprise funds are a very efficient way for any governmental unit to pay for itself. In the case of Parks and Rec, the, our enterprise fund is set up so that the fees charged for the various programs uh, are paid for by, by the, uh, the, the fees paid for the uh, expenses of the program. An enterprise fund has the added situation where it must balance. So unfortunately, if there is something unusual or something that is very expense related, the only way, there's only two ways to uh, balance the budget. One is to increase the fees on the participants, which I have worked extremely hard to make sure doesn't happen. And the other is to charge the entity that's using the facility or using the uh, uh, thing that's causing the money. And in, in this case, it is all the services that Parks and Rec provides to the town free, like the common, like, uh, I see them out of time, but things like that. It's, it's a very complex situation, but Parks and Rec receives a, uh, a stipend from the town to pay for these things which balances the budget. Okay, Ms. Carp? Um, I can honestly say I'm not very familiar with the Enterprise Fund, but I can say that, um, in my opinion, the Parks and Rec uh, Recreation Department has done an excellent job um, keeping fees uh, stabilized over the last few years. Um, I think that, um, as a commissioner, I would continue to work uh, with the department uh, to continue to keep fees at a reasonable level um, so that they um, can afford all of our citizens to participate in events and, and continue to um, have, uh, you know, um, the opportunity to um, participate in sports and, and uh, participate in, in the activities that we provide. Um. Okay. Uh, Michelle has our next question. Ms. Karp will answer first. Okay, um, the next question is related to programs and do you have any ideas or any new types of programs that you might bring to Parks and Recs in the coming year? Um, I do, actually. Uh, last year I uh, actually um, worked with the, uh, well I launched and managed a very successful uh, Women's Flag Football League in Hopkinton. I worked with the Parks and Recreation Department uh, collaboratively to uh, put that program together uh, we received uh, a national sponsorship from the NFL Flag Football Association, um, which included uniforms and equipment for the teams. Uh, we had approximately 40 women, four teams. Um, I recruited players, captains, uh, developed schedules, coordinated field logistics, um, utilized social media uh, communication, community outreach, and partnered with Parks and Recreation to determine the fees. Um, I personally feel that there is a tremendous opportunity, um, a growing need for additional adult athletic programs in the community. I would love to have the opportunity to bring more to town. I do have some ideas. Um, uh, I will bring them forward, certainly if I'm elected, um, to get, put them into place. Um, but even if I'm not elected, I will continue to work with the Parks and uh, Recreation Department to bring some of my ideas forward. All right, Mr. Sonnet. The idea of the Parks and Rec Commission is to provide an environment where someone like Kelly can do and accomplish what she did with the flag football. Our job is to provide an infrastructure and an environment where new programs can uh, be launched and prosper. I think we've done that very well. If you look at the adult programs, the children's programs, they've expanded tremendously over the last several years. And it's because we have a very competent staff in Town Hall that understands the community and how to manage programs. And we have a board that has provided the environment that these things can happen. It's a situation where uh, when we go to a meeting, we say, hey, we heard about 
we have an opportunity to, or what do you think about? It's that type of environment that uh, allows these things to happen. Okay, Michelle has our final question. Mr. Sonnet will answer first. Okay, we're back, back into the weeds, guys. So <laughs> again, we have to ask Parks and Rec, what is your opinion on the lake's uh, weed problem and potential remedies? Well, I am Parks and Recreation's representative to the Lake Massamonoc Weed Management Committee. The selectmen appointed a five-member committee to study the problem and come up with a comprehensive recommendation on how to fix it. The, uh, the uh, board consists of myself representing Parks and Rec, the chairman of the Conservation Commission, and three members at large, uh, basically people that really care about the lake. The problem is horrendous. We could lose the lake if we don't fix it. The idea of herbicides or dredging or harvesting, these are all things that are being looked at by our committee. We're currently studying what effect the drawdown had on the weed problem, but we have not decided or come to any conclusion at this point. We hope to over the summer and in the fall. We have had two public sessions where we've had people come in, the, the public come in, we plan more, and uh, by probably October, we will have a recommendation for the selectmen. All right, Ms. Karp? Um, obviously, uh, Eric has a lot more uh, knowledge of the situation than I do other than what I've been able to read about and study about. Um, personally, I would be open to um, hearing all of the options that we have to take care of the problem. I do agree it is a horrendous problem um, and it is very serious in that we could potentially lose the lake if we don't address it. Um, I don't know enough about uh, the chemicals and, and the side effects and the things that they could uh, to do, uh, could uh, potentially do to, um, you know, our, our children, our our animals, um, the, the, the nature uh, in the lake, um, but I am open to hearing all of the um, options that we have. I know that dredging is an incredibly expensive option. Um, you know, it seems to me like um, it would be very, um, very successful, but again, would be very expensive. Um, obviously, chemicals. There's a um, there's a very large concern about the chemicals, um, but I would be uh, very open to hearing all of the uh, options that are out there and making the right decision for the community. Okay, that will do it for the question portion. Each candidate will now have a one minute closing statement. We will start with Ms. Carp. Okay, thank you very much for having me here tonight. Um, the Parks and Recreation Department uh, provides Hopkinton with high quality athletic programs, um, enriching community arts programs, maintenance of our beautiful parks, trails, fields, and common areas, um, and provides the foundation for many important subcommittees within the town. Um, I, I truly believe that the Parks and Recreation Department is the one uh, committee in town that can bring us all together as a community. Um, whether it's on the soccer fields or whether it's on the common, uh, enjoying concert on a Saturday night. Um, it's an important part of our community. Uh, as a commissioner, I will listen to you. Um, that is one of my uh, biggest strengths that I bring to the table. Um, I can help identify the growing needs of our community, uh, work in partnership with the department to ensure that, um, that uh, what we're looking for is met in a fiscally responsible way. Um, I will work to ensure that facilities and grounds remain safe and well maintained, and I will look to expand the offering of adult athletic programs and continue to improve upon our excellent offerings of youth and cultural arts programs. I respectfully ask for your vote on May 16th. Okay, Mr. Sonnet. I really appreciate what you have done. I mean, the environment you've created tonight to have a free expression on very, uh, very poignant questions that the community is interested in, from lake weeds to programs to facilities. This has just been tremendous. What I would say to the community at this point is, I've served you for a long time in many, many capacities, and I have enjoyed and feel like I have contributed more as a Parks and Rec Commissioner than in many of the positions I've held. I would appreciate your vote to reelect me to this position because the work is not finished. 
and the work ahead of us requires the type of leadership that I can bring through experience working in town government to this position. I truly appreciate and ask for your vote on May 16th. Thank you. All right, that will wrap up the Parks and Recreation Commission portion. I'd like to thank you both for participating tonight. We are going to take a short break. Coming up next is the Board of Selectmen debate. You are watching HCAM's Town Election Contested Races debate. Stay tuned.